This episode is sponsored by Catan Studio. to episode 38 of the Board Game Geek podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I am so excited to be here today with one of my favorite people in the industry, David Thompson, who is, I mean, so well known for co-designing and designing a bunch of games like, I don't know, Undaunted, all, the whole Undaunted series, Undaunted Normandy, and then War Chest. Oh, I love War Chest too. Resist. I still haven't played Resist, but Sniper Elite, Hidden Movement, Banger Game, and of course, the Valiant Defense series with like Pavlov's House. So many awesome games. How's it going today, David? It's, it's awesome. Thank you for having me so much. This yeah. Is awesome. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, any any time we get an opportunity to like do something together, I am just super happy because again, I love I love your games. I love your yep. games. You make some yeah. really cool games. Well, thank you. Yeah, as you, as you said, any chance to to get together and chat with you, I'll take it, no matter what the reason. So happy yeah, to be oh, here. Thanks, <laughs> thanks. So, what is new on your end? I know, like, I feel like every day I'm seeing like. Uh, BGG News or something, there's another game popping up with <laughs> your name. You're working on something with someone else. Uh, what's going on on your in your world? Yeah, so you know what the, the deal is? A lot of people don't know this. I have, you know, almost everything, pretty much everything now is that I do is co-design. And I don't actually, I'm not actually doing any of that design where I just pay people to let me put my name on those games. <laughs> so like, I just pick really good co-designers and they let me put my name on the box. It just works out really well. For me. Oh, oh but, <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, so so here's the thing. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm not a, you know, when you have like guests on and they're, and they turn into like marketing speak and they're talking about what's upcoming with them. Like, uh-huh. I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. So here's what I'll, here's what I'll do. I'll make it, I'll make a deal with you. I'll mention some stuff that's coming soon yes, so that please. all the publishers are happy, but then we get, <laughs> I'll then be we, happy too. <laughs> <laughs> but then we can talk about the, the actual reason we're here for. So yeah, but, uh, sounds okay. good. <laughs> okay. So here, so war chest nightfall, new expansion for war chest is coming out like right now, I think it's shipping to backers. So it'll be retail soon. Awesome. Um, I'm, that's really cool for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we weren't really sure that there was going to be another War Chest expansion. So when AEG reached out to us and said, hey, we're going to do this Kickstarter and it's going to have a bunch of expansions. What do you think about doing it? You know, an extra War Chest expansion. Trevor and I jumped at the chance. So super excited to cool. and, and it's pushing the game in some new ways, which is really fun. Um, so the next up after that will be Undaunted Callisto or Undaunted 2200 Callisto. Right. So. Sci-fi um, undaunted. Sci-fi undaunted. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So for a long time, we've heard from people saying, "Hey, I've I've heard about undaunted. I'm really interested in, but I'm not really into the war theme." And so this was a way for us to do to to kind of address that audience, but also, and I know I've told you this before, like each game in the Undaunted series has to be different, or Trevor and I will lose our minds, right? Because yeah. you can't just uh, you know, go back to the well and just keep doing the same thing, right? And so. Right. This was a chance for us to do something really different with Undaunted. So uh, hopefully people dig it. That's That should be out around Spiel. Cool. Um, I can't And wait. then same for War, War Story Occupied France. So I think also around Spiel time, uh, certainly they'll have early copies there, I think. And and what is that one about? So this I one's feel like designed, I know least about that. Yeah, so this one's co-designed with Dave Neal. So Dave Neal is primarily known for his work on like Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, Unlock. Oh. So he's he is Mr. Narrative, right? So that's his that's his background. And Dave, um, just like Trevor and I, uh, Dave and I met each other in Cambridge. We we're part of the same design group in Cambridge. And so Dave reached out to me and said, hey, what do you think about this idea of combining his you know, expertise, which is narrative games, with something with like a, a war background, right? So okay. a setting. And so War Story Occupied France, you can think of it, this is an oversimplification, but kind of think of it as like a choose your own adventure game mashed up with like um, some tactical combat, but narrative driven. 
So it's mm. it's something that I don't really think we've seen before, you know, because mm. you've seen a lot of narrative games like the Time Stories, those kind of games, but not with like a, a more, I don't not realistic and like a simulationist, but like you know, if you think about tactical options and stuff like that, right? It it okay. provides some of that. So very cool. Um, yeah, and it's set during you know, it's your your SOE agents. You're you know, so you're under your World War II occupied France trying to help help um, the Allies. So that's cool. Very cool. Um, and then the other two I'll, I'll talk about now because they, they've been announced um, probably next year would be when they would come out. One is Night Witches, which obviously I'm designing with Liz yes. Davidson, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. That's coming from Fort Circle. I should I should say the publisher. I should be a good boy. So um, <laughs> War Chest is from AEG. <laughs> Undaunted 2200 and War Story Occupied France are both from Osprey. So, yeah. Um, okay, so Night Witches, Designing with Liz, uh, coming out from Fort Circle. That is a solo or two-player co-op game where you get you take the role of a um, all-female regiment of night bomber pilots flying harassment missions during World War II. So, super cool theme. Yeah, yeah. I played yeah. it at uh, SD Hiscon uh, with Liz. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I, I yeah. loved it. Like the whatever the prototype you guys had there. Yeah, and you, and you know who the artist is for it, right? Did we tell you? Ah, uh, no. So an E and O'Toole. So <gasps> yeah, so Whoa. I mean, I'm super, super, super blessed That's that I've gotten a so chance to work cool. with. And and Quan Chai Moria is the the artist for War Story Occupied France. So it's like oh my, it's goodness. like the biggest hits, all the bangers, right? <laughs> and, and it's more of my scheme. I, I I'm also like I just get all the biggest artists to work on these games that I have other people put my name on. And so you know, I'm just riding on the coattails of greatness. You're this doing is my... great with your scheming. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and the last one I'll talk about, um, co-design with Jeff Engelstein, is Chung Ha. So um, that's about oh. the Ming voyages, the Chinese Ming yeah. voyages. And similar thing, Jeff reached out and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about this idea. Would you like to collaborate? And of course, I'm not going to turn down Jeff Engelstein because he's amazing. Right, right. So, um, <laughs> so that, that, was, that was a really fun one to work with. And that's going to be published by GMT. And awesome. I've seen the art for it. And I know you know this too, right? Like GMT is making some really strong moves in like improving the art direction and illustration. Yeah. And, stuff. and so I've seen the art and it's, it's pretty cool. So we'll see how the reception, that's a solitaire only game. So we'll see how the reception wow. is. For that that's, yep. that's all so exciting. I'm glad they let you put your name on it. You know, I, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, now uh. you're getting it. <laughs> I feel like I completely missed that War Chest Nightfall expansion, but I'm going to get it. It's like, I love War Chest. It's like one of those games that I, when I think about like dwindling my collection down to like a hundred games, it'll definitely be in there. And on that front, I just saw a couple of days ago, uh, Beth Hiley posted a BGG store update uh, for March and there are new geek up bits for War Chest. So I'm all over that. And then I also saw their Geek Up Bits for Tosh Kalar, which is a, another like kind of abstract strategy game with a little bit of theme to it, you know? Yep. Love it, love it, love it. Yep. So uh, for me, I'm just coming back from Austin. I was in Austin last weekend for South by Southwest. So I don't know if you heard of this, David, but there is a new movie called The Hobby, that is about the modern board game hobby and just like how it's it's kind of like a a view of it for people who aren't necessarily in it but so that they can understand why people like us are so passionate about it and so excited about it but it is also for gamers for sure but i'm in this i'm one of the quote unquote subjects that uh, Because there's a, a wide cast of people that tell um, their stories throughout it. And I was fortunate enough to meet the director uh, at some point. And it was funny because he bought me a beer because he, and this is before, long before I met him, he used Cardboard Creations to kind of figure out which game designers he might want to bring in. So like Elizabeth Hargrave and Eric Lang are featured in it. And... Uh, it was just such a cool experience. Like, number one, I've never been to Austin. I really, like, loved the city, and I, I want to go back. I had some really killer barbecue. Like, seriously, I had turkey and ribs from Franklin's, and 
I don't think I've ever had a better rib in my life. And the turkey. I think that like I've had deep fried turkeys. I've had all sorts of turkey, but this turkey, I don't know how they did it. So tender, so flavorful, amazing. So I really liked Austin. But for the premiere, like we we had it was screening at twice on like uh the fr- the first Friday of South by Southwest and then also on Sunday. And uh we went and did uh there were some of us there, like Daryl Andrews was there. Mm-hmm. And we did a Q&A after each screening. And that was really cool because even before the movie started, when Simon goes up to introduce it, he asks, like, how many people here are gamers versus not gamers? And I feel like it was almost like 50-50 um, at all of the screenings. But some of the people that we met were just really awesome. Like there was a woman there who showed up to watch this movie because she wants to understand her husband better. She's like her like her husband goes to WBC and she's like, oh, he does these weekends. And th- and she just like didn't understand it at all. So it was cool that she came to watch this movie, this documentary, and she walked out with a better understanding of like what her husband's uh, draw is to this hobby. But it's like the movie itself. I'm not going to spoil anything. It's just like I think just a perfect blend of being informative feel good like inspiring funny you know it's 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 really really like moving and I'm not just saying that because I'm in it I just uh like I kind of teared up when it started especially like each time I'm seeing it on the big screen just because I'm like also excited that it's like showing off our world to a larger audience you know it was premiered at South by Southwest so I think they're going to try to get it in some other festivals and eventually it'll be streaming somewhere you know, so people in uh, the U.S. can see it and Canada and hopefully all over the world, frankly. But um, that was something just really new for me. And I'm also now curious to go to like film festivals because it was just like it was so different being surrounded by all these people who are into film. And a lot of the people I was hanging with that were on like the crew for this documentary are super into documentaries. And I'm like, okay, tell me your favorite five documentaries that I need to check out from, you know, from last year or whatever. But it was just cool kind of seeing another, like being surrounded by people that are passionate about another kind of hobby. <laughs> no, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it it was also really cool that um, they ended up using a still shot that I'm in for the, for all the advertising so, you know, during screening, other screenings, they're like advertising other movies and my face just like pops up on the screen, like all over the place. And then in like articles and stuff, since that's the only still that everybody media wise has, I'm just like popping up. So that was, that was really cool. That was really cool. And besides that, speaking of like cardboard creations for a while, like I've been doing cardboard creations for like what, three years now. I don't know. But for a while, people have been asking for that to be on podcast platform because a lot of people like to consume long form interviews as podcasts. So I finally, finally, it's been on my to do list for a while, but I finally um, took care of that. And so now you can find Cardboard Creations on any podcast platform. And I have the latest two episodes, Apiary with Connie Vogelman and Lost Ruins of Arnak with Min and Elwin are up. And I'm going to gradually be going back. You know, our episode will be up, David. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go back through all the episodes and get them all uploaded there and m- make the Cardboard Creations episodes accessible on podcast platforms. No, that's awesome. Like you said, I mean, I'm, I just am, I consume podcasts constantly and I almost never watch videos. Like I have to really, really, really want to watch a video. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, so, um, I mean, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you have a, cool. You have at least one extremely happy listener. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. And the main reason I started it as a YouTube series was because I like flashing up images of the old prototypes and stuff like that. But hey, now you can have it both ways. If you mm-hmm. want to see it on YouTube, you can. If you just want to listen to it, now that's going to happen. So check that out. If you're into learning about game design and how board games are created, please subscribe and listen. <laughs> if you're not sick of hearing me from this. <laughs> but anyway, 
Today, we're going to discuss our favorite introductory historical board games for anyone out there who might be interested in dipping their toes in historical board games. Uh, David and I are both big fans of historical board games. I mean, you you design a ton of them, and I like I seriously couldn't think of anyone better to join me for this conversation. And for me, I find so much joy in historical games because, well, for lots of reasons, but like the joy that I find in them completely surprised me because I wasn't a, a, in in school. I never got into history. And I was never excited about history. And it took me kind of getting into board games to eventually get into history. So I like introducing these games to people to see if, you know, that'll happen to them too. Maybe it's something you never thought you would like, but, you know, you discover you really like. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's interesting because I can see the evolution of myself as like a gamer and a person kind of... um, transitioning over the last probably 10 to 15 years where, you know, I, I, I came to the board game hobby kind of late, right? Like, I mean, you know, kind mm-hmm. of recently. And so at first, when I first started exploring the board game hobby, I didn't really know what I like. I thought I would like what we know as like Ameritrash games, thematic games. And, and I quickly discovered Euros and that led me to war games. And my love for war games um, basically started around the same time as my love for military history. But what I've seen that evolution become now is like, um, actually, yeah, that's cool. I, I'd still enjoy military history. I still like war games, but what I'm really getting excited about is this explosion. And it is like an explosion in the last couple of years yeah. of historical games that are not war games. And I, and I like both. I love them both, yeah. Yeah. But, but I kind of view them separately, you know, kind of under the same umbrella, but, um, the idea of using games to explore some historical themes, especially like we're seeing, you know, themes for the first time ever, right? Like brand new, very interesting explorations of historical right. themes and not mil- not not war games, right? So, um, yeah. and, and I mean like serious treatments. I don't mean like, let's put a name of a historic city on a box and it's a Euro right. game. I mean like right. true historical games. Uh, it's super exciting. I mean, I, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but I, and, and we're not in the golden age because it's just starting, but like we're starting to see what I think, and we'll probably talk about this as we chat, like, I think some of this came out of Zenobia, you know, the yep. Zenobia Award, and we're yeah. starting to see all, of, that was a few years ago, that was 2021, but all those games are hitting now, and it's like 10 games from Zenobia 1 are going to hit, and really oh my cool god, history. we are yeah. <laughs> we are blessed, you know, with all of these amazing looking games, so... Totally, totally. But before we start talking about introductory historical board games we enjoy, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, David. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. So, I think you know this. Um, I, I spent a lot of time doing game design. I spend very little time gaming. So once a month. I figured, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's so cliche, but it's so true, right? And so, I mean, and the thing, and and I know you know this, I have a day job, I have a family. And so when you start compartmentalizing the time, something has to go and I am not going to lose the design time. So um, about once a month, maybe less, I have two two local um, friends that I meet with and we do some, some gaming. And that's when I get like the more, you know, crunchy, interesting, interesting kind of stuff. But the vast majority of my game time is done with my kids. And of that, 80 to 90% of that's done with my 13 year old daughter. So like, she is by far my number one top gamer, right? Like, that's awesome. You know, so, so it's not surprising (laughs) that my fresh plays come from some of the stuff that she and I have played. Okay, cool. So Mandala is my number one, uh, my, my first fresh play. And so this is a game from 2019. Um, designed by Brett J. Gilbert and my oft co-designer, Trevor Benjamin, and published by Lookout Games, right? So it's only for two players. Plays in about three seconds, if you know what you're doing. I mean, it is lightning (laughs) fast, lightning fast. No, seriously, probably like 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. It's interesting because I have an entire shelf dedicated to Trevor's games that I did not collaborate with them and almost all of those are designed with brett they brett and trevor and once again broken record brett also from cambridge right the same group in cambridge. oh cool cool so um 
and Brett was one of the people that I would call him like a mentor, right? When I first started getting into game design. Um, and so we all come from the Matt Dunstan, Brett Gilbert school of, of Cambridge design. But uh, <laughs> Sounds fancy. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so here's the thing. I have an entire shelf of all of their games and I play, their games are usually very simple, very, you know, accessible. And so I play them, them a lot with my kids. And for whatever reason, I would gotten Mandala. I played it like one time. I learned it, played it. I enjoyed it, but I didn't really get into it. I put it back on the shelf. And my daughter and I are, are typically what we do is we go to a coffee shop and we'll play there. And so I was like, hey, let's play, let's play something, but let's play something new, right? We've been playing a lot mm-hmm. of Final Girl, et cetera. And uh-huh. so I picked up Mandala and I was like, we're just going to read it and we're going to learn it. And I think that day at the coffee shop, I'm not joking. I think we played it like six times straight. <laughs> I mean, we were just we were like, let's play it again. Let's play it again. Let's play That's it again. That's awesome. <laughs> and I think we, it was it was within the last couple of months. We've probably played Mandala like 20, 30, 40. I mean, this like it's been our, our go to. Um, so it, for people that don't know, I should I should quickly describe it. Right. Um, it is an abstract game. Um, ostensibly, it's about making mandalas. But but really what you're doing is you have these color coded cards and you're making critical decisions about whether you play them into a central place that both players can play into, and that's going to drive your scoring. Or if you play them on your side where you're kind of driving the, the um, amount of influence you have. You, you can deconstruct it, though I think you could deconstruct most games, into essentially an area influence game, right? Because you're bidding for influence over the central right. cards, which are worth points. It has a super clever scoring system where... The, when you take on these color cards, they're going to set the value of how much each of those are going to be in the future, one to six points. And then there's multipliers. So, um, but like I said, super streamlined, abstract game, highly recommended. If you, you have 10 minutes to play, it's like perfect. Yeah, I would second highly recommend it. I actually, I had it for a while and I passed it on to somebody just because I have too many games. So you know, if there's a couple or something coming and they have room for a small, like I like to try to be board game Oprah and give games away here and there. And I, I know I passed that on, but yeah, I remember it is like a really good, I love the look of it too, Mm -hmm. but it's a quick banger and it's in one of those small square boxes, like uh, the size of like, you know, seven wonders duel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. One of those those boxes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that is Mandala. So uh, a couple weeks ago, is it a couple weeks ago at this point? I don't know. Recently, my mom and nephew were in town visiting. And so as we do, we played a lot of trick-taking games. But I also got them into rolling rights because after recording the previous episode, episode 37 with Antoine Balza, and I'm just realizing I'm having game designers on back-to-back episodes. That's kind of funny. Um, but that episode was all about rolling rights. And Antoine picked that topic. And I, you know, going into that, I was not like a big fan of rolling rights. I, you know, I've played some. I had enjoyed some. But it wasn't like, you know, something. It's not something that typically excites me. And after our conversation, I kind of became curious to revisit them. And I'm like, I've been on this quest to like find my favorite, like three or five, just so I have some, because I do like appreciate how portable they are, how they, a lot of them that are the lighter ones can, you know, you can get them to the table with lighter gamers, take them anywhere. But a quick deluxe, I ended up picking up at a local flea market, I think for like eight bucks and it was brand new. And that was a big hit. We played that a lot. And then in true family fashion, they kept begging me to just play something they knew. And I'm like, no, I got to expand your minds. It's like telling kids or adults to like try a new food because you don't know if you're going to like it or not. Give it a try. So I like always try to, you know, expand their minds a bit and throw something new at them. And one of the games that I threw at them is uh, a game called Triketa. And uh, along with the, the the Hidden Wolves expansion. But this is a game that I played last year at a convention and I remembered enjoying it. And when I was in Essen, I think I got hooked up with a copy of the base game and the expansion from the publisher. And I was like, this is going to be a good one to play with my family because it's super light, but there's like some fun decisions in there. And it's it came out in 2023. Uh, it's designed by Stefan Dora, who's who created For Sale, and Ralph Zerlind, 
who created Finca from 2009. I had never heard of Finca, but it seemed to be rated pretty well. And then also Dizzle, which is a roll and write game from 2019. And that was actually one of my one of my first few appearances on game night. I was playing Dizzle. Yeah, I don't remember how I felt about it. I I think it was fun. (laughs) But anyway, that was just he designed that also. This is, Triketa is published by Deep Print Games and Pegasus Spiel, and it plays with two to five players. It's a very light set collection game with like these nice, pretty components. They feel good in your hand. Um, Not quite like the Azul pieces. Like I'm trying to, I don't know what they're, they're made of, if they're wooden or they just feel nice and they're a nice shape. And this is a game, again, another quick one, maybe not as quick as your Mandala games, but it plays in like 20 to 30 minutes. So we ended up playing the base game twice, and then we played once with the expansion. So the game is played over four rounds, and you have these like animal tokens, and they they are numbered five through ten. So, you know, maybe the bear is number ten, all the bears are have the number 10 on them different animals have different numbers but they're numbered five to ten and you're gonna make these towers which my mom did not enjoy saying and she said that if i was going to talk about it on the podcast make sure the world knows that my mom didn't enjoy making those towers it was tedious for her um, but you you put these you stack these tiles in um into these towers and that you'll have four towers because the game is four rounds and then you go around and taking turns and you either draw a tile from the one of the from the active ta- rounds tower. You draw the tile and you put it onto one of. So we were playing a three player game, so there are three possible rows that we could place this tile face up. So maybe I pull the eight. I put an eight in row one, and then maybe my mom pulls a tile and it's a seven, and she can add it to that same row, or she could put it on a different row. So you're drawing tiles, placing them. You can also, twice per game, draw your tile, don't show anyone, and secretly keep it face down for yourself. But then after, like whenever you decide you kind of want to pass for the round, you're going to take an entire row of those tokens. So it's kind of like if you've ever played Colorado, Mm -hmm. like that kind of thing. So you either are going to draw a place animal tokens or eventually take one of the rows and say you're passing for the round and oh after you take the row that you want you're going to put all those their face up in front of you now what you're trying to do david is get exactly a set of three of a cert of each type of animal if i have exactly three eights whatever that animal is i'm going to score eight points for that because i made a triketa But if I only have two of them, they're just worth one point each. So I would just score two points. If I if I end up bringing in more eights, let's say I I brought in five. Now I have negative two points because every one that you go over three is a negative point each. So you're trying to, you know, make sure you're getting the good stuff. And I like that's part of the reason I like the secrecy because you need two of them. During the game, you no one knows what you have, so you can kind of plan and hope to not like sort of bust. But that that's really what you're doing. And then at the end of the game, you're gonna see who has the most points. Now the expansion adds these dark gray tiles and another animal that's worth eleven wolves. And the dark gray tiles get built under the towers for round two, three, and four. And you have to literally draft the tiles till you can actually expose one of those gray tiles to be able to take one. And the cool thing is you could try to get the the wolves. Oh, also all the gray tiles always go face down. So they're secret no matter how many you have, you always put them face down. But the challenge is in those gray tiles, they're also one of the other, the original set of animals. So there's a chance that you could bust if you're not careful but I like this game a lot. Like, I think the components feel really good. I like that it has this, like, push your luck element to it. You're looking around the table to see what other people already have. And you're trying to, like, place in a row where, like, maybe it won't be enticing for you to take that row. Maybe I'm trying to set myself up with something. And then with the the expansion, it adds even more intrigue. Because you don't know, like, my mom ended up accidentally, because I don't think she understood the rules, 
with the gray tiles, but like she ended up taking too many. So she busted on like almost everything. Meanwhile, I got the wolves. I got 11 <laughs> points for that. You know, <laughs> things, things were happening. But uh, yeah, so that is Triketa and the Hidden Wolves expansion. Have you seen this one yet? I have not. No, it sounds really cool. I'll definitely check this out. It sounds like something that that both my, my like gamer group and even my family might dig. So this sounds really cool. Definitely a solid family game. And I think, again, if you play Colorado, it's that it's yeah. that kind of uh, vibe to it. Oh, but yeah, cool. just trying to get exactly three of each animal token is the goal. Um, but yeah, that was a that was a quick one that we played. And uh, I mean, they played it three times, so I think they enjoyed it. Yeah. Well okay. enough, aside from my mom with the expansion. <laughs> 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 so that is Triketa. Okay, so my number two. Now, uh, I promise you that 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 Lookout Games and my friends did not pay me to do this. But number two, <laughs> number two is Patterns, which is essentially the sequel to Mandala. So what happened was, after we yeah. started playing Mandala, we were like, "Holy cow, this is amazing!" You know, where has this game been for the last four four years of our lives? So we went and picked up Patterns, which, like I said, is basically the sequel to it. Um, and I should note, there's a new game coming out called I think Flowers, maybe, and I think it's a multiplayer game. It's sort of in the same oh, yeah, trilogy. Yeah. I know nothing about it, but but so so patterns published in 2023. Um, also, of course, by Trevor and Brett. Also published by Lookout and exclusively two players. So it's interesting. It does a lot. I mean, it borrows concepts from Mandala primarily in the way that it scores. Right. So you still have these six colors. It still has this concept of you know whichever one you get in the one position, whichever color is going to score one point in the second position, et cetera. So you're still trying to do this this like clever thing of like, okay, I really want to wait for a while to declare that my six point color is going to be yellow. But if I wait so long, by the time I get to yellow, I can't, you know, orchestrate this positional um, placement so that it scores a lot of points. Ah. <laughs> so both games feature that same thing, but but patterns, whereas Mandala, I mean it is it can be kind of as thinky as you want it to be, right? There's a lot of depth there that's not immediately apparent. Patterns is much more like, uh, so if it's a, there's a spatial element. So what happens is you have these circular tokens. You seed the entire board at the very beginning with all the tokens. They're just flipped face down. And so over time, you're placing your your colors. Let's say I want my black. Mm-hmm. I'm placing it on the board and I can take pieces off the board and put them back on so that I'm orchestrating having contiguous pieces of black that belong to me and I have black in whatever position it's scoring in. And so you're trying to manipulate the board. So there's a ton of spatial uh, adjacency, you know, um, uh, to the way you position your pieces. And so it has all of the sort of thinky bits that you would expect from like a spatial abstract, but with the scoring um, concepts that were created in Mandala. So Extremely cool. good. Uh, it was interesting, you know, my daughter, same playing with my daughter. And so I got it and we immediately started playing it. And I was interested to see, because it is so much more thinky, I was like, well, which do you like better? And she Yeah, wasn't, that's what she, I'm wondering. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't able to decide. Like, she was like, I like them both. And and I tested that. I was like, I wonder if she's just saying that. But but the next time we went out, she said she wanted to play Patterns because she hasn't played it as much. So she liked it at least enough as close to Mandala that she preferred playing it at least, you know, more to ah. check it out. Um, I don't what even know which you? one I like. Yeah. You know, it's really <laughs> tough. I mean, it's funny because in some ways they're very similar, but they give you a very different feel in terms like if I'm if I was like because we'll sit in the floor by the fireplace and play games. Right. So if I'm like. Hey, let's play this real quick and real fast and light and and just like not not trying to think too much. Then we'll grab Mandala. But if we're like kind of sitting down to really think a little bit more about the game a little mm. more deeply, then Patterns is the choice. So, but both good. Both cool. Really good. Yep. Yeah, I want to check that one out. Yeah, I remember. I maybe Eric wrote about it in BGG News at some point, and I was like, ooh, because I I did like Mandala. Mm -hmm. And I do, yeah, there's that other one that's coming out that is expanding it to multiplayer, more than two players. Very cool patterns. Well, I'll just quickly mention before I tell you my next game, I have recently been getting back into Lord of the Rings LCG. (laughs) And I'm, like, years ago, I bought a whole bunch of cards before the revised the new revised version came out 
And, you know, I have this nice box that I got off Etsy and like some upgraded tokens and everything. I pimped it out and I just haven't played it for a while. And something just put me back on a Lord of the Rings kick recently. So um, I, I've, I haven't played it as much as I've organized it in the past week or so. But I did bring a scenario with me to Austin to play solo in the hotel room. And I did like set it up and, and just have it on the desk there um, playing throughout the weekend when I had some downtime. So I just want to give a shout out to that because that is definitely on my mind. But I'll probably talk about it more after I play it a bit more. And also the, uh, the other reason is because the next game I'm going to mention kind of took me by surprise and it is the freshest play for me. It is a game called Sea Salt and Paper, a card game. It was originally released in 2022, an English-French version from Bombix. And then I have the English-only edition from Pandasaurus, which came out in 2023. Uh, this one is designed by Bruno Cathala. And uh, you probably everybody knows Bruno Cathala, maybe, but Five Tribes, Cyclades. Uh, he did all the duel work in Seven Wonders Duel and Splendor Duel. And then it's also co-designed by Theo uh, Riviere, and uh, who co-designed The Loop and Draftosaurus, which I haven't played either of those. And then I uh, thought it was interesting that both of these designers also designed a game called Naga Raja, and I never played it, but I heard I think I heard it was pretty good. So, um, so this is not their first collab. Uh, but this Sea Salt and Paper plays with two to four players. You have these origami marine animal cards that you're going to be building up a hand of cards. And there are some cards you're going to be playing onto the table to like activate abilities. It is a very, very straightforward game that you can kind of get into, you know, pretty quickly, especially if someone's teaching it to you. But there are some cards in the deck that are used to score for set collection. Like, hey, if I have three penguins at the end of the game, I get five points. But then there are other of these cards called duo cards that want to be paired. Like there's a boat. And if I have two boats, um, I will play them down and get some ability. Like maybe I get to draw another card immediately. I don't remember exactly what that uh, ability is. But I know that there's a swimmer and a shark that get paired up as a duo. And when you do that, you get to steal a card from another player. But basically on your turn, you're taking one card you're either going to take one from the two discard piles. There are always two discard piles. Or you can draw two from the deck and discard one. And this is like Fantasy Realms, Arboretum kind of. like not Maybe not as tense as those games, but it's like every time you discard a card, if the next player picks it up, you're like, ah, crap, you know? Uh, so you're, you're thinking about, but then you're also thinking about what you're needing to kind of build your hand so you have the best scoring hand possible. After you get a card, which is required every turn, then you can play any duos. So I might play a duo that lets me draw another card, and then that might give me another duo based on something in my hand. So then I can play that duo. So you can play as many duos as you want. And duos are just worth one point. Like that pair of cards gives you an ability, and it's worth one point. But when you have at least seven points within your cards on the table and or the cards in your hand, you can end the round. So this is a game where the players need to end the round or the end of the round is going to happen when the deck runs out and nobody scores any points. So when you have seven points in your hand or more, you can end the round one of two ways. You can just say stop at the end of your turn and then everybody's going to like re you'll reveal your cards, score up your points. That's it. Everybody, you take note of the points because the game is going to end when a certain VP threshold is hit, depending on the player count. So in the two-player game, when somebody gets to 40 points, it'll end. But you could also do something a little bit riskier and call last chance to end the round. When you call last chance, all of your opponents get to take one more turn. And then, well, you reveal your hand and then they get to take one more turn and what happens is if any of your opponents at that point have more points than you, your last chance was a bust and you will only get to score a color bonus, which is of all your cards, take the color you have the most of and you get one point per card. 
wah, wah, wah. Wow. Not, not good. But if you do a last chance and you do have more points than all the other players, then you get to score your points plus the color bonus. Yeah. So, so it's a gamble though, because you see, you you'll be looking at me, you'll see, I oh, I have eight cards in my hand. What do I have? It could be junk. It could be a bunch of like every starfish or whatever, you know. Um, so it's it's kind of and my and my friend Cassie in a two player game, and this is very good with two players, also by the way. My friend Cassie called Last Chance. It's her first time playing, and she was like feeling pretty confident. And I had more points than her. So I ended up like scoring all of my points and then she only scored her color bonus. And then like future games, she was just terrified of calling last chance because <laughs> you never know. But that's kind of a neat way for the round to end. Um, there's a, one other thing I want to call out in this game is there are mermaid cards. There are four mermaid cards. And if at any point you are able, you have all four mermaid cards in your hand, you win the game. The whole game, not the round. You win the game. It's an auto victory. So you're kind of collecting these mermaids hoping to achieve that. But also the mermaids, the other good thing about them is they let you score a color bonus. So regardless if you were um, had a successful last chance, you'll score a color bonus with a mermaid. That's how they work. Um, so if you have two mermaids in your hand, you'll score two color bonuses. Your bonus for your highest your color or the color with the most amount of cards you had and then the second most amount of cards you have. So mermaids are good. But uh, yeah, so this game I played at BGG Con. Somebody told me it was good at some point. Like I think it was Lincoln and then Nikki. A lot of people were like, oh, this game's fun. So I bought it at some point. And I played somebody else's copy at BGG Con. And we don't even think we finished the game because we had to like go to dinner or something. But we played with the full player count of four players. I don't know if I didn't get it or if I just don't love that player count. That's TBD. But I left that experience kind of lukewarm on it. And I think I was just going to sell it. But then when I was in Austin, uh, just in the hotel lobby, you know, almost time to head to the airport. Simon, the director of the hobby, breaks it out. He's like, hey, he's like, this is like just a banger of a filler game. I'm calling it my little pop song game that he's been like enjoying a lot lately. So he's like, let's play. It's really good with two. So we played it. And I was like, oh, okay. And then literally the next day I start digging out. I'm like, where's my copy? Because now I want to show it. And like last night I got to play it. So I played a two player game with Cassie. And then Matt joined us for two, three player games. And we just had a, a blast. And now like I won the first game, Matt won the second game. It was his first game and he won with the mermaids. Oh, that's He awesome. won with the mermaids. Oh. The, the other crazy thing is the game that I played with Cassie, did we, I think we played two, uh, two player games, but the game that I played with Cassie, I had three mermaids. And she stopped it. And the next card I would have drawn would have been the fourth mer. So that is that happened twice. So there's some like little fun tension with like trying to collect those mermaids. But uh, all in all, like I really dig this game and I'm glad that I revisited it because I didn't have a good initial impression of it. Like just something didn't, I could have been hangry. I don't know. It just didn't, it just didn't resonate with me, but now I, I like it. And it's like one of these games that I'll probably keep in my backpack, keep in my purse, whatever, to just break out and teach to other people. Also, I played the expansion with Simon. There's a, like an like eight card expansion or something like that. And now after playing last night, just the base game, like three or four times, I, um, I'm totally Right, like I already ordered the expansion because I'm like, okay, I miss what they uh, what they bring to the table. Yeah. But yeah, so have you played Sea Salt and Paper? I, or I have it? not, but I'm super interested. Um, you know, Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson and I are, are, are good friends, and he's oh, cool. he's a big fan, big fan. He's oh, talk, he talks cool. about it a lot on his podcast for Games to Go. Um, and I think it's on BGA because I, I don't really yes. play a lot on BGA. Yes, but it he, is on I think BGA. He plays there a lot, so that's one I'll definitely pick up because he's. I mean. It's been kind of, it's this interesting, like it, it, it's been in the hotness and I don't mean necessarily like on the BGG hotness, though it was probably there too, but it seems to have been like this organic growth of like just word of mouth and 
popularity and stuff. So I'm super interested in trying it. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, yeah, like I think Simon describing it as a pop song or something like that. Cause I feel like I keep wanting to hear it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, I will definitely probably get a couple more plays of this in this week and I can't wait for the expansion to come. That is sea salt and paper. And now a word from our sponsor. It's the 21st century and the island of Catan is at a crossroads. Long gone is the agrarian society of the island's Viking ancestors. Today's Catanians need energy to keep society moving and growing, but pollution is wreaking havoc on the island. Catan New Energies is classic Catan with a modern and relevant twist. In this standalone game, you'll harvest and trade resources and build up your society while also managing its growing need for power. You'll start the game using cheap fossil fuels that cause pollution events and interrupt resource production. But as you invest in renewable energy, pollution events are replaced with rewards for sustainable strategies. Catan New Energies is a standalone board game for three to four players aged 14 and up. It is printed and assembled in the USA of sustainably sourced wood and cardboard using no plastic components. Available for pre-order now on CatanShop.com. So, David, what are we talking about here when we're talking about historical board games? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mentioned this before. I mean, um... They can. I mean, you know, if I say historical game, obviously we're not, you know, not, it's not, the point is not to exclude war games. Right. right? But, but I think it's an important distinction to, to at least let people know there is a world of games about historical topics, not just to paste it on theme, like an actual examination of a historical topic in an interesting way that aren't, you know, his, uh, military war, you know, war themed. And, and for a while, Many of those were like war adjacent, really. You know, you had some games, and we'll talk about one of mine, at least one of mine, if not a couple, fit into that category. But now we're starting to see exploration of non-conflict related topics at all. Um, right. So, you know, I mean, if, if used broadly, obviously it can include anything historical. But at least in my mind, that's that's kind of where I go when I think about historical games. Yeah, and you're right. And I think that is like a big distinction and why it like – the fact that it's growing more is because people like historical board games are not all war games. And mm-hmm. that message is kind of spreading like wildfire. And there are all sorts of even like Euro type board games that are coming out that are more historically rich versus having just like a pasted on uh, setting. Um, but there are lots of different types of historical board games out there and it's really exciting and like you i like i like war games also but i know some people don't like the conflict Mm -hmm. but there are just so many games out there that are historically based now that are and and some have really cool really cool historical topics that aren't war games so i tried to with my list of games that i picked i tried to think about different types of gamers what would be a good introductory for all different types of gamers. Well, not all of them, but <laughs> I kind of uh, compartmentalize my list into like, hey, if you like these type of games, you might want to try this one first, you know? Yeah, I did. I did a similar thing. I try to make sure, I mean, all of my games I love. Like I didn't, I didn't, yeah. you know, leave my list of things that I absolutely love to try to find something. But, but I also try to, to cover kind of sort of a, a broad category. And one thing that I'll mention before I forget, because this is really cool. Multiple times, my kids have come home and told me, like my daughter most recently came home and they were learning about gorillas in World War II. And she's like, mm-hmm. Daddy, we were learning about gorillas and I knew what it was because we played Resist. Right? Oh, <laughs> so, that's like, awesome. They'll that's come so home awesome. And they're, they had, I had a similar example with um, playing, uh, we've played 1754 by Academy Games uh, about the French and Indian War. Same thing. They're like, yeah. You know, we've, we've even talked about taking games into school, like as a, you know, a learning thing. And these are games that are exploring historic topics, right? Which is, and I won't, I won't mention some of the others because we, you know, we'll, they'll, they'll show up on my list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was also just thinking like, for me, like, you know, you and I are both very passionate about these games. I think for me, um, 
I get, I'm not like the most competitive board gamer out there. Like I'll play to win and do my best and everything. But I think the thing that excites me about board games most is kind of just exploring the game design space. Like I'm just fascinated by like these, a work of art, these board games that people create, which is also why like I started Cardboard Creations because I'm like, how, how do you, how did you make that? How did you make that thing that makes me feel this way when I play it, you know? And so I feel like with historical board games, it's like next level because it's like you take all of that like joy and curiosity that I get from like exploring different board games. And then you have this like really rich history that's melded into it, into the me- mechanisms. And then it makes me, they all seem to make me like want to explore the history that they portray even more, which is wild. Like I have so many books that I've bought over the years because I'm playing certain games. Have I finished those books? No, (laughs) but I start reading them and one day I'll finish them. I have book ADD. Um, (laughs) But, but it's just the fact that like, it takes me that next level. Like I'm like, Oh, I played this game or I'm about to play this game. I want to learn more about this. And This is just something I never thought would be my jam. And so that's why I'm so excited to kind of share these games with more people to see if they, you know, to see if it's something that hits with them. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And I I think the other thing to think about is like, as you said, games, playing a game about a topic you're not familiar with can be a fantastic jumping off point to learn, go and learn more about it. The other thing is that like, so if you look at games... And I, and I can mention these because they're not on my list. Look at games like the upcoming Winter Rabbit or Cartini um, from Darkness to Light. Those games, they're about topics like I probably would not go and pick up a book on Cherokee like mythology, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. that's like I don't have anything against it, but that's not what I'm going to p- pick up in the bookstore. But I'll play a game, Winter Rabbit, yeah. and then that's going to trigger like, oh, this is really cool. And I got this unique perspective into this topic. Now I'm going to, you know, I might, even, even if I don't go and uh, like read books about it, like it's an exposure to a topic that otherwise you would never, like it doesn't, it's not in your like your normal sort right. of worldview and what you typically have around you and stuff. So yeah, absolutely. Just having the diversity of games that are coming out about interesting topics that otherwise you wouldn't be exposed to. Totally. And so f- for my list of games that I picked, I just want to clarify, because I, I thought about this, the, my games aren't necessarily like if you've never played a board game introductory level. It's more for if you play board games or some board games, but you haven't played any historical board games like this. These are like good. I feel like good starting places. So some of them on my list may be a little bit heavier. Some may be a little like really light play. You know, I have a, a variety, but it's I, I was coming from it more from the perspective of you've played some board games and now you want to dip your toes into historical board games. Yeah, so that's awesome because without without conferring with, the, with each other, we did the exact same thing. Because that's where oh, I'm okay, coming cool. from. Too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. There is. These are not just intro games that happen to be historic. These are these are in many ways targeted at non-historical games, but are already gamers. So same Right, yeah. right. Same here. Um, I did have some honorable mentions, which maybe I'll... Do you want me to shout those out sure. first? yeah. Okay, okay. I'll just breeze on through and then we'll get to your first game on your list. So I wanted to shout out Dual Powers Revolution 1917. I've mentioned it on episode seven of the BGG podcast, so you can probably like get a more detailed overview if you're curious on that. But um, I just find it to be a really unique card-driven game and it's very like underrated. Like I feel like not many people are talking about it. And there's like, the, the it had that calendar system that added just another layer to what you're doing on the board and everything. So I, I really like that as, you know, if you like Watergate or something like that, like it's it's light like that, doesn't take more than an hour to play. And then for another CDG, I had Twilight Struggle Red Sea. Twilight Struggle is such a banger, but it's a beast. And I love that they made Red Sea because it's now you get all that tension and those tough hand management decisions of Twilight Struggle, but in a smaller package and at much shorter playtime. Um, you can play this on your lunch break. That's why it's in GMT's lunchtime series. 
And then I have votes for women as an honorable mention because it has been talked about a lot on this podcast. So um, I, I reviewed it last year with Mandy Hutchinson on episode 11, and then it came up on episode 22 and a few other times. But it is just such a fantastic theme. We have a female designer and, you know, it can be played co-op, which gives it even more accessibility. And the production is just killer. And, you know, it, it, it's just it's just such a banger. So I had that as an honorable mention. One that I haven't played that I picked up at some point is called the Red Bernoose, uh, Algeria 1857. This is a cooperative ga- board game with deck building and area control. And most historical games will often feature men as leaders. And this one uh, features a woman as, as a leader. And I'm always here for deck building and area control. And that it's cooperative is, you know, makes it a good, good one to, ch- uh, to check out. And then how could I not mention my, all the David Thompson games? So <laughs> I, 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 you know, technically these would be on my list. But again, I've talked about many of these multiple times on the podcast. So that's the only reason they're in the honorable mention list, but like Undaunted Normandy, any Undaunted game, just such fantastic deck building with a modular board setup and scenarios, like super banger games. And I think if you like deck building, like regardless if you like history or war games or not, like it's just all of the Undaunted series is so awesome. And hey, if you don't like the historical aspect, we have the new one coming out, uh, 2200, right? Yep. <laughs> um, and then my final little shout out, again, under the David Thompson umbrella is the Valiant Defense series from uh, Danvers and Games. Uh, these games are solo games, but you can play them cooperatively because, you know, that's what you can do with solo games. But there's Pavlov's House, Castle Itter, Soldiers and Postman Uniforms, uh, Lands Earth Ridge. Like these games are like really fantastic. They're accessible. They feel different. And they're also like covering like different, like kind of unique aspects of uh, World War II, you know? So, um, I had to throw those in because I picked other games for my list to talk about, but um, I love all of those, and I think they are like great intro games. No, that's awesome, and and I appreciate it. And the check is in the mail. So. <laughs> Wait, not not Venmo? Venmo. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Thanks. All right, David. All right, it's your time to shine here. What is the first game you have on your list? Okay, so earlier I mentioned I have a couple of buddies locally that we get together for our game days. Usually we're playing war games or historical games. That's kind of our thing. Though we're all Omni gamers, so we'll play anything. Lately, we've been on this this kick where we're exploring like what I would call like diplomacy type games, right? Mm, or yeah. or like negotiation kind of games. And so we played things like Churchill and the new prime minister from GMT. Both are good, but most recently, and I think of them of this sort of subgenre, the one that's hit best for me is Versailles 1990. Oh, so, yes, yes. Yeah. So this one's by um, Jeff Engelstein and Mark Herman. Uh, it came out in 2020, published by GMT. You can play it. I'm, I think I'm going to be a broken record a couple of times when I say this. You can play it one to four. Go find something else to play it one and two. It's probably fine. I don't know. <laughs> but like, I mean, it's not that it's bad, but like this game is designed to be played with three or four players. Right. right. So go get three or four players and play this game. Um, it's, I mean, the name probably gives away. It's, you know, it's about um, post-World War One. you know, sort of like each of the players is taking the role of one of the leaders. So you're you know, Woodrow Wilson or or whoever, and you're, you're coming together. And so you're each representing one of the nations and it's got this, like what I would call the sort of like organic, it's not, it's, I guess it's a little bit like semi co-op, right? Because what you're doing is you've got issues that are on the table and you're providing your, you're bidding your influence on all those different issues. And if you win the issue, you get to decide what happens. And so you know, clearly you want to decide what's best for you, but also you're trying to, you know, um, uh, you know, negatively impact the other players. And so often right. <laughs> you'll, you'll be given the opportunity to do really shady things like, hmm, I'm going to put this, this um, issue up 
because I have no vested interest in it, so I don't really care. So I'm going to make the other players invest all of their resources in this one <laughs> while I'm actually spending my time just going yes, and focusing yes, on the one I want. Love right? it. So it's a lot of like, you know, playing the players, what I call those kind of games, right? The, the rules are pretty streamlined, relatively speaking. This is a good, now I will say this is an example of a game like you mentioned earlier. This is not for like new gamers. This is, right. you know, if you're like a Euro gamer or something, you, you've got time in the hobby, you come over, this is going to be a game that gives you really interesting peek into a part of honestly now that we know 100 years later pretty horrible history because a lot of world's problems came from this process right but right. um but yeah it's a really fantastic you know like i said playing the player a lot of opportunity to do some shady things that are sort of within the uh, the confines of some pretty deep choices but low complexity rules versailles 1919 wow I this completely slipped my mind. This is a great pick. I love this game and wow, kudos. I'm glad. I'm glad cuz I'm glad we're going to have some some different things to talk about here. But yes, I would wholeheartedly second that. The, that game is so fantastic. And it is like very like it's Churchill is way more complex, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, and I just I love the production, like the presentation of this game too. The way it makes you feel like you're the people are the issues are in the waiting room and it slides down and yeah oh it's so good I have to, I have to get this one back out Here, here's a table. little funny story so it came out in 2020 I think it was Gen Con 2018 or 19 I got to play a prototype Jeff was there and he was playing he was you know play testing his prototype and so we met but he had no clue who I was. So it was awesome that, like, you know, <laughs> I played his prototype. He had no idea. Later on, we've become friends and stuff, but that was funny. Cool. So that's Versailles 1919. I'm going to kick things off with a game that I've actually only played once, That uh, and I played a prototype copy of it, and then I backed it on Kickstarter, and I got my copy, and I haven't gotten it back to the table, but now I'm realizing I'm really eager to play it, and that game is Halls of Hegra, 2022 three release from Tumpet Games. It's designed by Peter Shank Olsen. And this is a solitaire game, but it's, you know, this is one of those solo games that can unofficially be played co-op if you want. Like if you play with a friend, you know, maybe even three people, you make decisions together. Yeah, you can totally do that. Or you can just play it by yourself and get, get really sucked in by yourself. So yeah, like I said, uh, the designer had sent me a prototype ahead of the Kickstarter campaign. I played it and I wrote a preview article in BGG News for it. Um, and then like I liked it so much that I was like, I have to back this. And I got it <sighs> sometime last year, I think it, it, it delivered. And it's in, it's in my shelf on the garage, my shelf of opportunity of like several Kickstarter games that I haven't gotten to the table yet. But it basically, it sets you in an abandoned mountain fortress in the Norwegian village Higra in the early days of World War II. You're challenged with commanding volunteers and soldiers to defend against a German onslaught while managing like a bunch of factors such as your morale and keeping locals calm and gaining supplies and just keeping your forces healthy by the end of the game. So this game is on this list for uh, a few reasons, but I think, and I'm going to quote myself from my article, <laughs> it cleverly combines worker placement, bag building, and tower defense mechanisms with a survival backbone in the same vein as Robinson Crusoe, the, This War of Mine, and Dead of Winter. Like, people, if you like those kind of, like, survival games, and I think it would probably even align most with like Robinson Crusoe. This game is going to give you that feel with like with the history, you know, you're playing through these, these uh, different stages and there's like a mobilization stage, which takes place over three days. And then there's a first attack, which takes over, you know, another three days. And then there's the final siege. And if you have a, enough healthy defenders at the end of the last stand, like at the last siege, you win the game. Otherwise, you can lose if um, your the surrender track hits the end. You don't have enough healthy defenders left, and uh, yeah, it's just like really cool. Like there's there are like different the the way it 
does solo worker placement is like really fantastic. You have tough decisions because there are different types of defenders. You may need to place different places. And I just remember loving it. And that's part of the reason I thought just today, I was like, I, I want to put this on this list for people who like those kind of survival, like worker plate and who like worker placement games. This could be a great place to start. Have you played Halls of Hegra? Okay. Are you ready for this? Yes. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this. So, okay. so first of all, I make a lot of solo games. I don't actually play many solo games. Okay. I play a lot of solo games cooperatively with my daughter. Okay, Halls of Hegra was one of my top, like top three games from last year. It's my top solo game ever. Period. <gasps> Number one, and it's not close. Wow. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It would have been on my list, but I, I didn't really include like the rec military theme games on my list. Okay, so that's the okay. only reason I left it off. It cool. Is I'm glad phenomenal. you love it. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, oh. I got the chance to play a prototype and I knew the second I played a prototype, I was like, this, this is just unbelievable. And as you said, you know, so here's what's really, so it, for, first of all, it does worker placement for a solo game, which there's not that much of. And Mm -hmm. when it was like before last year, there were basically like no worker placement war games. So last year, you know, we had general orders come out, right. But also halls of Hegra almost the same time. And there's, there's a game I think called Napoleon's conquest, which is like a six player game. And they all hit around the same time. And so to see worker placement done as well as this game does it with this really cool theme. um, Yeah. It's magnificent. Yeah. So I need, I need to break this out. So it's pronounced Hegra. I don't know. That's how I pronounce oh, it. Okay. I probably, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no there idea. you have it, folks. That's so, that's so cool to hear. Now, now I really want to like break this out on the table and like, I haven't, it's still in shrink right now, actually. Yeah, it's but, phenomenal. Um, that is Halls of Hegra or Halls of Hegra. <laughs> One of those. We're probably, right? they're probably both wrong. <laughs> oh, okay, okay what's your next game okay so my number my my first game was versailles 1919 mm-hmm. my next game is battle of versailles okay Ooh. so now not to be confused battle of versailles is not a battle in the traditional sense this was a <laughs> 1973 fashion show um this is a game that was it came out in 2024 Ooh, designed by people whose names I cannot pronounce, probably Eloy Pujahas, I don't know, and Farron Rinalius. I don't, those are horrible. Just go look it up this, on BGG. This this was out at, at Essen last year. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Oh, you, yeah. you said 2024. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know. No, well, you know what? No, it's interesting. It says they that on BGG. They started it? It oh, says it on BGG. I... And I got it in 2023, but I was like, okay, whatever. That's what BGG says. I'll go with that date. Cause... I think they launched a second Kickstarter for like a reprint or something okay. like that. Maybe that's yeah. why. Yeah. Okay. No, I definitely got it towards the end of last year, for sure, like 20, in 2023. Um, published by Salt and Pepper Games, who's a phenomenal publisher and plays with exclusively two players. So... Okay, like I said, Battle of Versailles was this 1973 fashion show. And so I know nothing about fashion. Nothing. <laughs> I know negative information about fashion, okay? So uh, much to the chagrin of my daughters. So um, apparently, you know, this is not probably not surprising to anybody, but at the time in the 70s, France was like, everything was, you know, France ran the show when it came to fashion. And so apparently there was this, you know, this thing that became, I guess, known as the Battle of Versailles, where you have some upstart young uh, American designers who are going head to head with like the established French designers. And this is all real. Like they're, you know, it's about an actual event that happened. And so the game is a card driven game, right? So which means, you know, you're playing cards for in the war game world, what we would think of as ops points and events. But here you're, you know, you have a, a multi-use card driven kind of game. And the game does some really clever things with the way in which it handles cards. So like um, one side gets to play more cards over the course of the turn, the French do, because their fashion show is like two and a half hours long and apparently kind of boring, you know, whereas the American <laughs> fashion show was like 35, 40 minutes and quick. And so they only get three actions. And so there's tons of this interesting asymmetry built into like what your objectives are. Each side has its own goals. Um, the cards generally work up the same way but their strengths are very different so um 
yes, it's just really cool tug and pull. If if you're familiar with games like Watergate or whatever, it's going to evoke a lot of the same tension in a very short period of time, which is my, probably my favorite type of games are those like, give me like, you know, two or three hours worth of tension packed in like 30 minutes. Right. Yeah. And this game does that. It does it in spades. So, um, but I mean, it, this is like, so I got this game, I backed it, um, first because the publisher is amazing. The art's really like, um, unique because it's actually from a, like a uh, fashion magazine artists, right. Not just a you know, yeah. board game artist, which nothing wrong with that, but it's interesting to see some difference. So I got it on the strength of that and it sounded interesting. And I thought, again, my daughter might be interested in the theme. And this has been another one that she and I played it like nonstop. I mean, we probably played this like <laughs> you know, awesome. 20 times within a month of, of getting it. And so she loved it. Right. So, you know, my daughter's 13. She plays a lot of games, but it was it was certainly accessible enough for her to get into it. But like this is what I'm talking about when I talk about exposing people to themes that otherwise like never in a million years would I know about a 1973 fashion show like it's not right happening, right. right but this is an awesome expo you know way to get exposed to something like that oh my gosh i'm not like i'm so kicking myself because both these games are fantastic and i can't believe i didn't think to put them on my list i guess that's just a show like there are a lot of games that could be great for you know introducing people to historical board games but yeah, I was I was blown away by that idea because yeah, you hear the Battle of Versailles and you think it's going to be some kind of war game. And I've only played a partial game of this. It's on my shelf right now, so I need I need to like get you know get a full game in because I I know how it works. I love it. I love that there's that like runway mm -hmm. you're moving down and everything. Oh, so cool! And I love card driven games too. Very cool, Battle of Versailles. Okay, so my next game is, I'm sure not on your list probably, but it is Border Reavers, Anglo-Scottish Border Raids, 1513 to 1603. I had talked about this in depth on episode 30. You're going to hear me say that a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, on episode 30, uh, it was right after I played it at, at SD Histcon, where you were. We were mm -hmm. both there. Yep. Um, this is a 2023 release uh, designed by Ed Beach, who also designed Here I Stand and Virgin Queen. Uh, it's published by GMT Games, and it plays with one to six players. So... This is a game that's set, you know, in the midst of these raids and battles that were happening along the border between England and Scotland in the 16th century. And each player is going to like represent one of the major families just trying to protect its borders. You're trying to like manage your livestock. This game is on this list because number one, it like when I played it, it, it just gives me such hybrid game feelings. Like it's such a like. I've never heard of this, like, I've never heard of Border Reavers before. So, like, the the topic itself seemed very different to me, and it, it made me curious that, hey, were these families? But the game itself has card drafting, it has, like, resource management, and, like, just, again, this this really unique historical theme. As you play through, like, it doesn't feel like a war game, but there's, like, some conflict that happens but i love that you could you're kind of making your family unique and like all the choices you have and the way the event cards work i think this is just another i mean it just came out last year but it's it's sort of a a hidden gem um and i think like it was fantastic at six players i still i still need to try it at four players um i don't know how it would be below that but I just I love that you you have this element you know pe people who are into all the uh, Uwe Rosenberg games with the sheep and whatnot it, you'll you'll feel right at home with this one because you literally have I don't know any other GMT game that has sheep tokens and horses <laughs> but um but yeah this game is just fantastic and I think it's a good one to try um, in terms of complexity. I would say it's like, a, it's you know, maybe a medium plus. It's it's really not that bad. Like you just play through these phases. You do some card drafting. You know, you're having fun, like making your your faction, your family sort of unique. And then, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really cool game. So um, that is why Border Reavers is on my list. Any experience with that one, David? No, no the only, the only experience, I mean, um, so 
I know Mark played it with you and he was super yes. excited. So we talked about it. Um, it looked, I mean, I, I came over a few times. Now I will say it, it seemed to take you all a while, but I think you divided your game up. Like it was like interruptions and stuff going on, right? We we did take a while at, at that game. I'm trying to remember why it took a while. I think you guys had like breaks and interruptions or something that kind of drug We did it. We also had a lot of new players and there's a lot in that game that you can do simultaneously. And I feel like some things we weren't doing simultaneously mm. that we could have been or something like that. Okay. But even still, I think it took us four hours to play, but I, I know you can get that down. Yeah, it looked really, I mean, just, just the theme, first of all, the theme is, is really interesting to me and like the combination of different mechanisms and stuff. But um, just the visual was really cool, I thought. Yeah. Like having yeah, it all laid out, yeah. It, yeah. it, it looks really different. And I like how you're like managing your notoriety in different areas also. So there are all these things that you're trying to – kind of vie for and it, it just made for a really exciting game so um definitely a fan and i think that's a good crossover for someone interested in like dipping their toes like if if i would say too with any game we're mentioning if the topic or the mechanism sounds interesting like lean into that you know pick pick games that you want to you know that excite you off the bat with something either the theme or the mechanism but uh, what what's your that was Border Reavers. So my my next one is Stonewall Uprising. Yes. Okay. So so here's a, so okay so a little bit about the game came out in 2022 designed by uh, Taylor Shuss Taylor Shuss uh, published by Catastrophe which is an interesting publisher they're doing lots of cool things um, print on demand using Blue Panther so they're able to do like explore some cool ideas similar to what you see coming out of um, like Hollenspiel. And then this is another two-player exclusive game. So this is an interesting one. Like I, you know, I've said this multiple times, I don't play a ton of games, but I'm usually really vocal about what I play on social media and stuff. And I try to like really talk up things that I enjoy. And coming out of 2022, I had like a few games that I was like, these are the games of 2022. I love them, blah, blah, blah. And uh, one of the things is I think I got Stonewall Uprising in 2022, but for whatever reason, didn't get it to the table in 20, until until 2023 and it, it wound up being like the best new game to me that year it was unbelievable um just in terms of like what it's able to do with some interesting deck building things right and in, in sort mm-hmm. of interesting in new ways and then of course uh, like we've seen you know in the last decade or so applying deck building to new and interesting ways so so for stone stonewall uprising it's about the the stonewall riots uh back 1969 and of course, these riots were um, the L- LGBTQ uh, sort of responding to police raids, um, and it became this like, uh, like I guess this key milestone, right, in the community coming together and and like that movement. And so, but what the but the game is not limited just to that, just to the upright, to just to the riots and the response. It's it's um. It starts in the 60s, so it's like it takes place over three phases. So you'll play through the 60s and 70s and the 80s. And you're either taking the, the, the role of the man or pride. Now, I will say I personally struggle, like, taking on roles in some games, right? Like, I don't want to play the man. It's just I just don't right. want to do it. And so every once in a while I'll hit a game like this um, that, like, I can't play with my daughter or whatever because I don't want to put either of us in the position and so I had to wait around until a buddy of mine was willing to play the man, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll be like, okay. And I think actually with this game, um, I was like, I, I overcame my, my, my issues. And I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm willing to, to, to take on the man just to see the experience of my myself. Because it is a very asymmetric game, right? You have very different goals. Um, the man is trying to detain and demoralize people. Pride is trying to shift the Overton window, which is interesting. Like it's this concept in political science about shifting, you know, the community, the, the public's thought and awareness and stuff so that policies can be passed, which again, you know, we're talking about a board game being able to model things like the Overton window, which you wouldn't necessarily expect to, to see. Um, so that's what games are, are awesome in doing, but you're playing, there's three different sort of like, um, um, tracks i guess concepts that you're playing for right systemic support public support and um individual support and so 
yeah, it's just, it's, again, you'll see this is a recurring theme. I like short games. So it's another relatively short game, two player, super tense. Um, but I mean, here's the thing. I consider myself like, I would consider myself an ally, but at the same time, I'm full disclosure. Like, of course, I've heard of the Stonewall Riots. I don't really know the background, right? And so right. playing this game, you know, you're you're like, okay, I'm, I'm playing through this game. I probably want to know a little bit more about what I'm playing about. So mm-hmm. it's just another really kick, um, good jumping off point for that. Great pick. Great pick. This is one that almost made my list, too. But I actually, I kind of was, I slightly was suspecting you were going to have it. So that's part part of the reason I was like, well, I'll, I won't do it. But yes, yeah, Stonewall Uprising is like really good. Um, and the, the deck building tug of war aspect, everything is uh, really, really great with that one. So the next game on my list is probably the most complex game on my list. And it is Cuba Libre. And this is uh, a coin game from 2013 designed by Volko Runke and Jeff Grossman, published by GMT Games. It uh, plays with one to four players, but it's best with four because you'll get that that full full experience. Some people love playing it solo, though, so don't, you know, I'm not going to say it's bad at any player count, but I think it's best at four. So coin games, if people aren't familiar, are counterinsurgency games that feature multiple asymmetric factions, usually four, uh, competing against each other in an area control struggle, but each with their own motivation kind of corresponding to their unique victory conditions. And the gameplay for coin games is centered around an event deck of cards and an initiative uh, system like where you're you're you have to be like this this eligibility system that's really really innovative to determine like the turn order for each round and it's also like a lot of these coin games you know some factions are encouraged to form alliances with other so there's a lot of like, interesting negotiation opportunities a lot of like tense chess like moments where you'll be like kind of try to be subtle about trying to achieve your victory condition at the right time, hopefully without other people noticing and kind of watching out for other players doing the same thing. And um, Cuba Libre basically depicts the insurgent and counterinsurgent conflict in Cuba from 1957 to 1958. And um, each player is going to take on a role of a faction that's trying to run Cuban affairs. So you have like someone's going to be the government and then you have three insurgent factions. You have the, the leftist movement, 26 July. Uh, Then you have like the anti-communists and the people who are against the, the government, um, um, the direct uh, directorio, the DR they're called. And then you have like the organized crime syndicate also in there and everybody's got their own motivations and they're basically using military, political, and economic actions to kind of exploit various events. And so players can build and maneuver forces to influence the population and get resources. And you're all you know, you're working to achieve your your goals. But the reason I picked this game is because there are a lot of people out there who love root and or just any as- games that have asymmetrical gameplay similar to root. This game, I mean, Root was in or Cole was inspired by the first coin game, Andy and Abyss, when he created Root. So the roots of Root <laughs> lie in coin games. And I think that Cuba Libra is still a just a really great one to start with. And again, this is not this is not a light game. Um, this is definitely heavier and it, it'll it'll take some time to learn there are a lot of videos nowadays on this one in particular but it has a smaller map so um i feel like it's easier to digest and get into and it doesn't take as long as some of the other more complex ones to play also the british way is another great entry point for the coin series, um, but that's just for two players. So you're not going to get the the four asymmetric factions going, but it's still like a really good way to kind of like dip your toes into um, into the coin world. And that just came out last year. And when you get the British way, it has four games in one box. So they have four different maps and they switch up some of the components to kind of go over like different uh, British uh, insur- counterinsurgencies. 
But yeah, I think Cuba Libra is still like I have people who I know that like mostly play Euro games that are always interested in like, hey, I, I'm kind of curious. I want I want to learn that one. And also, I would say for my friends, uh, a lot of a few of my friends who were like were heavy Euro gamers, this was our kind of entry point into historical games is is the coin series. And I think one of the reasons is because, you know, the pieces you're moving around wooden wooden pieces on the board. You know, it looks like it's this area control kind of game. So there's some familiarity. And um, yeah, there's just so much there's so much going on. There's like from a design perspective, it's it's really, really, really cool. And um, there are a ton of games in the coin series now and even more coming out. But again, I think Cuba Libra, if you're looking for something that's four players, um, that's that's a good one to start with. Yeah. I, you know, one thing I would just mention is um, it, it's often cited as like probably the best one to start with. I will say for me, it, it is the first one. It's the first one I played. Um, but for me, I found it a little bit more accessible to start with something like Liberty or Death because I understood... Like it was closer to oh, me. Like I, I knew more about it, right? And yeah. so it, I didn't have to because I didn't, you know, when I played Cuba Libre, I didn't really understand. I certainly didn't understand um, the like intuit the motivations and stuff of each of the factions. And so you're trying to like learn the game and understand why you're doing things. But when you play something like Liberty or Death or whatever you the coin game you might be most familiar with from a historical perspective, some of the um, opaqueness i guess about understanding their motivations kind of melts away so ah. th that's the only thing i would say is like if 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 you look into coin and one of the you know about one of the topics more than the others that might be a good place good to starting start. place so just an idea for folks yeah dip in their toes yeah and for for me uh when i first picked up uh kuba libre i ended up watching the documentary series uh is, is it just called Cuban Revolution. I don't remember what it's called. It was it's on Netflix or it was on Netflix years ago. But I ended up watching that whole it was a documentary series and kind of that familiarized me a lot with what was going on. But yes, that is a really really good point. If there's something that that you know that you know more about going into it, that could be a good way to start cuz then it, you'll connect with it a little better, a little easier. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so my num my next one, um, and I have to be very careful. So, I mean, are they in order? I don't know. But <laughs> this one and the next one, I flip flop back and forth about which was going to be my last one. So, okay, this was my top game of 2023. You knew it was going to be on my list. You probably avoided it. Land and Freedom. It's about the Spanish <laughs> Civil War. Uh oh. <laughs> I did. I didn't avoid oh, it. Oh no. It's on my list too. <laughs> but I think I knew it was going to be on yep, your list yep, too. Yep. So, so whatever, we'll both talk about it. <laughs> so this came out last year. Um, designed by Alex Knight. It's his first design. So I'm super selfish because, like, he. I think he created his first game is better than all my games put together. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is published you know i mentioned earlier catastrophe games and um hollandspiel they use a public they use a printer called blue panther and blue panther themselves have started acting as a publisher so this is published by blue, blue panther so it's another print on demand game so it's always going to be available for you so you should go out and buy it now um the player yeah. count again this is another one it says one to three play it with three players play it with three yes. players yes. that's where the magic <laughs> is you want the full magic of this game. Don't cheat yourself out of that. Play it with it. <laughs> right. So in this game, so it's about the Spanish Civil War. So you are going to take on the role, uh, but nobody plays Franco. Nobody plays, you know, the the, the Spanish, right? So you're going to play um, the anarchists, the communists, or the moderates. So you're going to play one of the groups that's fighting against, um, you know, the, the Franco's forces. And... I so I mentioned earlier when we talked about Versailles 1919, it has what I would call as like some sort of like emergent gameplay that kind of gets at some semi cooperative concepts. Mm -hmm. When a game has, when a game is a semi cooperative game, which is to say that like the structure of the game forces this concept of semi cooperation, I don't really like those games. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and I don't like them for all the typical reasons that people will quote. Like it, you have games where like, well, I know I'm gonna, not going to win, so I can throw the game. All those things that, you know, right, are very right, cliche, right. right? This game is the 
best semi cooperative game there is. I'm not. I'm not. It's not even open for debate. <laughs> I've declared it. It's got to be the truth. It is unbelievable. And and then what happened was Alex just did a really good job. So during the course of the game, it's a, it's another CDG, another uh, car driven game. Uh, though it has some in really interesting tableau building options, right? Yeah. So that's really yeah. cool. Um, but during the course of the game, you're trying, you're vying for influence, and you're going to be seeding this bag, a bag of glory, which I love that name. Um, <laughs> you're you're going to be seeding with your tokens. But the way the math works out, no matter how well you do or how poorly you do, up until the very end of the game, you at least have a chance. Now, it's all probabilities. So if you've played the worst game you've ever played of it, you're probably not going to win, but you're still in it. Right. You're still in it. And right. You still have a chance. And so, you know, everybody's in it up until the very end. And it just creates some of magnificent, emergent, you know, gameplay between the players. You can ask Liz Davidson about how, how much of a backstabbing communist I am. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's just great. It's a perfect game in terms of like, um, trying to balance your self-interests in, in winning the game versus the, the interests of the group and helping, you know, defeat uh, Franco's forces. So, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is the game I had at my, my number one slot mainly because, yeah, I wasn't really ranking them per se, but I feel like if I was going to today have some people over that are like, we want to try a historical game. I'm pretty sure I would break out Land and Freedom. I know you officially declare this the best <laughs> semi-cooperative game, but I'm trying to think of other semi-cooperative games that I've played. I'm, I'm not even really sure, but like this is like the way this semi-cooperative nature of it works where, yes, we have to like work together on stuff. We have to talk about like, oh, who's going to take care of that? Who's going to do this? But you also have your own interests in mind and you're trying to be subtle about some things too, because if you're not, people are going to kind of target you. And, you know, there's this like really, really awesome, like three, three way tug of war. And I think, again, it's another historical topic that a lot of people won't be necessarily familiar with. And I love that, like the fact that you can do some like engine building with the way you play cards into your tableau. That is so cool and like refreshing because it's like we play a lot of card driven games. So anytime there's something like that's doing something a little different and th that's neat, I love that. So yeah, and this is this is again this was on episode thirty three, um, one of my favorite games of twenty twenty three, and it. Yeah, uh, it was also I I brought it up after the the SD Histcon and uh, on episode thirty, so um, yeah, I'm I'm all about Land and Freedom as well. Great game, great game. So wait, that was your number. That was your number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we'll jump to my number two, and then we'll go to your number one. Now I'm, I think I know what your number one's going to be. We'll see. Uh, so my number two is 1815 Scum of the Earth. This is another one that I've mentioned before on the podcast on episode 23. It's a 2022 release from Tristan Hall and his publishing company Hall or Nothing Productions. It plays with one to two players. This is an asymmetric, competitive, tactical card game uh, about the Battle of Waterloo. And for me, I mean, people probably know this already, but like I love card games. I love LCGs, TCGs, all of them. So this this game to me is like if you are that player who likes LCGs and or you like, um, let's see, like Netrunner, Arkham Horror, Ashes Reborn, Flesh and Blood, like stuff like that, and you want to try a historical game, like this is a really cool one to try. Hall or Nothing sent me a review copy of this at some point. I think I saw like Ricky Royal had posted videos on it. And I was just like, ooh, like this looks really, really, really cool. And you're basically racing your opponent to complete your own stack of object objectives so you can get to the Battle of Waterloo objective and kind of start chipping away at these three frontiers that are in the uh, center of the table between you. And you have this like three by three grid of cards that you're playing. They have different effects. All the cards have like really cool artwork and they also have historical flavor text. And I love, you know, I've been so into Keyforge for the past like 
since November, since mid-November. I don't know how many months that is right this second, but um, but like this kind of like one of the things I loved about Keyforge is that we're like racing to get our our amber so that we can forge these keys. And this game gave me that like same feeling. It's like we're not like head to head just fighting each other. It's like we're both trying to like play cards and 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 pay for our cards. You know, there's like resource management, hand management um, to kind of chip through our objective decks to then be able to say, OK, now we're at the Battle of Waterloo. Now we want to start kind of damaging these uh, these fronts to kind of win the game. So that like that race element to it. You can also, which I haven't experimented with yet, um, do some like deck building and and play with different decks with it. But like this to me, like scratches that itch of I am someone who loves LCGs and TCGs and I love historical board games and war games. And this is just like that perfect blend to me, that perfect harmony. And yeah, it's just such a great game. So I think if I were you know, sitting down to play a game with a friend who also lives like card games like that. And they wanted to like try something historically based hundred percent. I would try this. I know uh, Tristan has like other designs that are historical that um, follow a similar system. And I want to try those at some point too. So there might be, if, if the, uh, the battle of Waterloo isn't exciting, you, you could probably check to see, I think he has like three other games that are on different um, aspects of history that might be more uh, appealing. But I think that the card game is just like, it feels so thematic. I loved like all the decisions of, you know, when, when, when you get certain cards out, they help you with your resources. Otherwise you're like, Oh, I don't want to get rid of that card. I want to play that, but I need to do this. Like really, really rich decisions, really awesome game. Um, and it's not that complicated. Like it's, I, th- I think on the BGG complexity, it was like a 2.38 or something like that. Yeah. So there you have it. And, and my number one would have been land and freedom. So we already <laughs> covered that. So that is 1815 scum of the earth. And what is your last game, David? Do you know what it is? I want to say it's votes for women. Votes for women. You know me so well. I knew it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, so anybody that's been around me for the last couple of years knows that this event, Votes for Women, is it was my favorite game of 2022. Um, we could talk about it, but I, anybody that's listened to this podcast knows what Votes for Women is. Um, came out in 2022, <laughs> yeah. designed by Tori Brown, published by Fort Circle, plays one to four. That player counts imported. Uh, you can play it solo. You can play it teams, you know, opposing each other. You can play it two players head to head. The way I played it, almost every time I played it, was two player co op against the Oppobot. My daughter and I played as, you know, on the side of the suffragists because, like I mentioned earlier, not really interested in denying the women the right to vote. So, right, right. <laughs> so, I mean, and my mom, my mom and I played this co op too, by the way. Yeah, that's awesome. With that's the awesome. Oppobot. It's yeah. so good. It's such a good game. Um, it's a great, I mean, you know, People will compare it to things like 1960. I think it's it. You know, gameplay wise, I think it's just as good. Um, I think it explores this topic in an interesting way. I think it does a lot of really clever gameplay things right. You know, in terms of just the way the the um, two side, the asymmetric two sides. Of course, the United States um, political system does us some favors because of the cool wind conditions. It's baked into the game. So that's kind of nice. Right. Too. Right. But yeah, I mean, this game is like, in my mind, this is like the quintessential historical game, right? Mm. It's, it's relatively low complexity. So maybe not like a person's very first time playing, but the fact is you could play it. You could introduce somebody and play it co-op, right? Which means yep. it's super yep. easy to get somebody into it. Um, but yeah, everything from like the clever gameplay to the really rich historical stuff. And of course, it has what, you know, has come become to known as the Fort Circle treatment, which is to say like the highest possibly, you know, possible production quality. Yeah. So phenomenal. Yeah. So it's just it's in my mind, like it's hard to say anything would top this in terms of like an exemplar for the histor- what a historical game is or should be. Yep, and I knew it was going to be on your list, so <laughs> that's why. I, but I had, I did, I did at least remember to say it as an honorable mention. Yep. But yes, I agree. It's it's so so fantastic and perfect for this list. 
Like that's, it's such a, and you're right. Like, even if you're a newer gamer, like this is one you can get into yeah. too. Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. So that's votes for women. And those are our games recommendations for like introductory historical board games that if you're curious about dipping your toes into this space, uh, highly recommend checking out some of these games or, and there are like the tons more that we didn't even mention that are, that are really great. And it just seems to be this, this growing market, you know, and, uh, especially we, like we were, we were also talking about Wuros. Yeah. yeah. War related Euros that are coming yep. more and more. Yeah. That's a whole separate list. I mean, that's, that's really where, like, if I was to pick one genre of game, Wuros, War Game Euro hybrids is, is probably the number one thing. But the other thing we didn't talk about are all the games that are, up, we, we mentioned it in passing briefly, Zenobia. And we're about to get all of the, you know, everything that was designed in 2021 is about to hit. We've got like 10 games that are about to hit and all of them, you know, we were involved. We know we've played these games in their prototype form. Um, Like the the world of historical games are about to explode. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, David, thank you so much for like joining me today. Like I knew you would be the perfect person to, to, like I have since before I started the podcast when I was like making my list of people I knew I would want to talk to you've been on it I don't know why I waited so long you know life just happens and takes you in all these different directions but I'm so glad that we had this opportunity to talk and also that it's something that we're both like so passionate about absolutely and yeah and it's all it's also always great to hear about games that uh people are putting your name on (laughs) (laughs) no seriously absolutely like i said at the front you know it's it's really cool just to just to chat with you we could i feel like we could talk for hours totally you know of like minds but to be able to chat with you about something we care about so much is is fantastic yep totally totally so hopefully i'll see you at like gen con or sometime later this year yeah yeah hopefully uh hopefully i'll be at gen con that'll be the next time cool well thanks again yeah thanks for having me You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgamegeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming! Happy gaming!